Hello again, and welcome to the 2022 edition of the James Rainey Memorial Lecture. It's a series that celebrates the legacy of two London literary icons, my late parents, James Creerar, Jamie Rainey, and Colleen Thibodeau. I'm James Stuart Rainey, and a co-organizer along with the two Susans, one of them my sister, Susan Rainey of Galliano Island, BC. And I think Susan is one of those watching us through the miracle of the uh, technology we see up there. I think those, and uh, I think there are a number of you from ac across Canada and what do they say around the world, but uh, joining us, we're welcome is here. Uh, welcome to this beautiful space in New Zealand, London. And of course, the other Susan, if I may, I shouldn't say the other Susan. Susan, Susan Wallace, my beloved, and also handles the uh, the literary financial business of my parents' estates. So not only is she involved with this particular event, but if you feel like reading one of my mom's poems, then she can get you the, the, the going rate, which is always generous. As always, we are grateful to the Words Festival for giving us the lecture a home after its first few years um, under the Stratford Public Library banner. Thanks, as always, to Carolyn Doyle for guiding the lecture two words and for Josh Lambier and the crew around the words for helping us settle in here in the last years. I have to say, uh, like so many endeavors in the arts these days, this year's lecture is shaped by sorrow and loss. Uh, the 2022 lecture was be to be delivered by Stan Dragland. Stan had given a memorable lecture at the auditorium venue when, in, uh, in 2019. Um, and we, we remember that as we also, we went virtual as did the festival really the last couple of years with other kinds of, we had music, we had theater. But we, we heard from Stan that his, his discussion that day had inspired some more explanation, explorations of the works of James Rainey. And in turn, they were becoming a book to be published by the Porcupine's Quill. The Susans and I were very excited about hearing more of, you know, hearing more of these discoveries in 2022 and invited Stan to return for this year's lecture. We stayed in touch during the earlier part of this year and it was apparent that Stan was excited about where the words were going to. Tragically, Stan died this summer. In the days following that shock, it was apparent how so many in the Canadian literary community and beyond loved and respected Stan as a friend, writer, editor, ally, and mentor. At that time, out of, out of shock and, and grief and respect, but we paused any thought of the lecture. What followed is a moving example of how our community responds and begins to heal after such a devastating loss. First, we received an email from Stan's partner, Beth Follett, in mid-August. Writing from Newfoundland, she said, between summer visits from his adult children, Stan hunkered down on July 31st and August 1st and wrote a 15-page draft lecture that felt good to him. He told me he needed to whittle it down to 10 pages for the November lecture. Soon after, Beth forwarded that draft, encouraging us to edit it and proceed with the lecture. Inspired by Beth's generosity and particularly at a time um, of such immediate grief and, and sorrow, but My sister, with assistance from her husband Ian Chun, edited the draft. We also began to look for someone, and here in my mind it was ideally someone in connections to, uh, with connections to Stan Dragland and Jamie Rainey to deliver the lecture. After discussions within the Words Fest community leadership, Stratford novelist and my old friend Terry, or friend of old, I shouldn't say old friend, I, a friend of old, Terry Griggs was approached. I was honored when Terry accepted, and I, I think it's fair to say it was within 
within moments that you were, you were it was just, it was a tremendous uh, honor to hear that. I'll talk a little bit about Terry. I have a, a more extensive uh, biography of Stan that I think I'll share perhaps after, after the lecture. Um, but here, Terry supplied me, had, claiming that she, she read about herself and learned that she'd written three novels, as well as four novels for children, two collections of short stories and linked stories in the most recent one, The Discovery of Honey. Terry has been nominated for the Governor General's Award, shortlisted for the Rogers Writers Trust Fund Fiction Prize, and won the Marion Engel Prize in recognition of a distinguished body of work. In 2010, she was honored with a Project Bookmark Canada plaque in Owen Sound. And uh, very recently, and Terry was, uh, says, passed this along as well, she's finished a novel that's set in 60s Yorkville, provisionally titled Contrary Wise. And is that an Alice or Looking Glass World? It is a Looking Glass, it is a looking glass World, which is a, a connection that, that I feel right away. And, and to quote Terry, um, well, just also shaping this afternoon is the time that Terry was a student and was now, I will reluctantly call Western University, from 1972 to 1978. And I'd like to say that was one of, the 70s were one of many golden eras for the UWO English department. She defended her MA thesis on the work of James Rainey in 1979. To quote Terry about that, uh, that occasion, most of the examiners involved in that day are gone. Dick Stingle, Catherine Ross, Ross Woodman, and now Stan, my thesis advisor. So with all those poignant and moving connections in mind, please join me in welcoming Terry Griggs to the Words Festival as we honor the words of Stan Dragland in the 2022 James Rainey Memorial Lecture. And do you feel, after we'll do some more material on Stan, perhaps after the, the lecture, do you feel comfortable with that? Feel comfortable with well, if I talk, there's some material on Stan here I'd like to share after the, after the lecture. Yeah. Oh, you're, okay. You don't have to use That's the steps. That's a good way to start. Oh, no. There, there, feel it. Are you set? I'm, I'm, I'm set. Let me, let me find my bag of tricks and my cane and I'll waddle back down here. There we go. Oh, look at all the water. This is great. I know, I know. I'm going to take that. Somebody else has to walk both that for me. Oh, here, I'll do that. <laughs> What a gentleman. Well, we always see if this happens. <laughs> thank you, thank you, James. It's uh, uh, a truly, it's it's an honor and a privilege for me uh, to be able to deliver. Uh, Stan's words for him at this particular time. Um, it's been difficult, actually, to corral my words, uh, or corral my uh, thoughts about Stan lately. Um, they just seem to sort of to skitter off in a way. But the one thing I've focused on, um, I seem to have focused on, was uh, and we keep returning to is when I um, first met him in first year university. That was uh, it was second year university at his in his um, Canadian literature course, um, and it was that was great luck for me really to to meet Stan. I mean he was he was a great teacher, um, but he. He also, I think, opened a window for me. He allowed, I mean, he translated, the, there were words on paper that, you know, that he was able to, to uh, talk about and teach about, but he opened for me the, the presence, the living presence of writing. And I was, uh, you know, what did I know coming from a rural um, uh, locale, Manitoulin Island? Um, I was able to actually, he, he brought the words, he brought the words to life 
around, in the sense that I could uh, go to readings. I never knew there was such a thing. And uh, go to parties and meet writers. And, and it, it was uh, truly a revelation. It was, um, so this door he opened for me in, in, in this experience of the pleasures of writing and, and the work that's involved and what I've learned from, these, from this experience of actually meeting writers, um, I realized that, you know, I could perhaps step through that door myself and uh, dig my hands into this uh, material and, uh, you know, get them dirty. So, um, it's, uh, it was sad, as he was, uh, Sam was an important um, mentor to me because when I, when I started to, um, started to, to write, actually, what I did was after graduate school, I, I bolted from, from university, and that's when I began to write. And he was, a, he was a very important mentor to me and supportive. And it, he, and this established an enduring relationship with him. I was sad to see him um, go to, to depart from London and head off for Newfoundland, but he was smitten. And uh, he, just, he just really thrived there. I remember one point not too long ago, of, um, you know, we, we sort of lost, we kept in touch, we sort of lost contact for, uh, for a little while. And so uh, I, sent, I sent him one of my books, you know, it's sort of the book, and uh, he sent four books back. <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was kind of amazed. Um, so uh, the thing about um, all these wonderful books, and a, a, a range of subjects, most of them connected with uh, Newfoundland and, and his, and his um, adventures there. There was one gorgeous book on Gerald Squires, uh, an artist, a well-known um, artist in Newfoundland, and uh, a whole series he, that he did and wrote on called Strangers and Others, about um, one uh, um, a satirical comedy group that was on CBC for um, five years, I believe. Uh, but the thing I wanted, he's, he had this great interest and wrote a lot about Newfoundland, but he has a, had a steadfast interest in James Rainey. It kept coming, he kept coming back to the subject and writing about his thinking, and uh, he kept, he, um, he wrote, in fact, his last book that, and that's going to be published um, soon, in fact, on Jamie. And then, um, and then, he, then I'm now um, can uh, present this, this lovely personal essay of um, Stan's, which takes his thoughts in this very new book just a little further. So, I will begin. It's usual these days and proper to begin by acknowledging that we reside on or speak from indigenous territory. It's difficult to make the land acknowledgement heartfelt rather than formulaic. So let me try something different in the words of James Rainey. How can Wallace Stevens say, completely overlooking those who gave his state a name, that we never had a mythology in Connecticut? Surely you have to know who were the gods of your country before your arrival. I want to thank James Stuart Rainey 
Susan Wallace, and Susan Rainey for suggesting me as the lecturer this year, and Josh Lambier for inviting me. This lecture series is an important way to keep an important writer present to us, and it fits beautifully into WordPress. I'm here again because I found that my rainy lecture of 2019 only scratched the surface of what I had to say about the man and his work. I went home from London and began writing the book about rainy, forthcoming from Porcupine's Quill Press. I'd like to begin by reading you a couple of paragraphs from that book. I'll read some more from the book towards the end of my remarks. Otherwise, while some of what I say parallels what is in the book, it all falls differently here. And so it should. Every occasion like this is an opportunity to rethink. That's another reason why I'm grateful to be here. I'm not the only friend and colleague of Brainy's to have written about him and his work. But with the partial exception of James Stewart Rainey, who could hardly avoid saying he was writing about his father, none of these very fine writers makes anything of their personal relationship with the subject. I do. It's my way of departing from the impersonal academic approach. So here is a bit from the introduction of James Rainey on the grid. It touches on the fact that I had my disagreements with the man who was, early on, a literary father to me. The influence was so strong that to be or to become myself, I eventually had to turn back. I mean to be upfront about my relationship with Rainey. I suppose this is a version of the full disclosure that is a thing these days, especially in journalism. Perhaps the approach draws my work in that direction, or else toward memoir. Well, any writing, no matter how cool and remote, is a kind of self-portrait of the author. It is so, at least, to any reader who attends not only what is being said, said, but also to the how of it, the style, the structure, and all the rest, to everything that is literary in any prose argument, which is often most effective when it calls little attention to itself. Whether behind the technique or in it, though, we are all particular people as we write. We have our own predilections and limitations. If a little bit of that is allowed to show, perhaps something of the subject's complex humanity will also show. Perhaps his or her work will feel like something intimately connected to a maker, rather than some remote, basically inert mass of material to be poked at. I'm a little croaky. I don't know whether it's uh, allergies or whether it's m my love of scotch. <laughs> <laughs> James Rainey has said that David Milne wrote as well as he painted, and he was right. Feeling is the power that drives art, says Milne in a 1948 essay called Feeling in Painting. There doesn't seem to be a more understandable word for it, though there are others that give something of the idea, aesthetic emotion, quickening, bringing to life, or call it love, not love of man or woman or home or country, or any material thing, but love without an object, in 
intransitive love. From the verbal field, from grammar in this case, an intransitive verb doesn't take a direct object. A visual artist draws a metaphor that helps him point to something ineffable that he knows by feeling. Perhaps when the dust of a critic's reservations and grumbles has settled, it may be understood that he and his subject are linked by intransitive love. You may have noticed that I've called my book James Rainey on the Grid. And you may also have noticed that this lecture is called James Rainey off the Grid. And you may have wondered, has he come here to take it all back? His own book included. Well, no. But I'm shaking it all down in a different way. Otherwise, why bother going at the same material another time? For those who weren't here in 2019, and to refresh the memories of those who were, I'll sketch in where that word grid came from and why it began to work for me as an entry to Rainey's thinking and writing. In 1984, Rainey was one of the presenters at a conference on the long poem. Other writers at the conference were pushing post-structuralist literary theory, like Jacques Derrida's deconstruction, which held, to simplify it, that there were no longer any grids of meaning to make a foundation for one's thinking and writing. On his own presentation, Rainey had said that, quote, there has to be something outside ourselves that inspires and orders. Even our past traditions might turn the trick. And he stood out at the conference by emphatically rejecting the negativity he felt was embodied in deconstruction. The way Derrida works for me, he said, is that I merely react, not necessarily in a positive, optimistic way, but with images and metaphors and to hell with it. I don't care whether they're grids of meaning or not. I'm going to grid away. It makes me feel happy. The particulars of what he was gritting away with, all the literary and other patterns, forms, systems, are detailed in the book. He loved all kinds of lists and would build poems and plays around them. But the largest of these came from mythology and the Bible. In terms of literary theory, it came from Northrop Fry, a so-called structuralist whose anatomy of criticism advanced a hugely inclusive grid of literary genres and modes. His theory may be seen as describing a great big circle with every form and style of literature contained within it. It's very complex and actually quite beautiful to contemplate. For I had the whole literary field mapped out, in other words. Rainey loved the map as much as he hated deconstruction. I heard him say once that he'd sold his soul to Northrop Fry. <laughs> I took that as the overstatement it was, knowing the many ways in which Fry doesn't touch his work. But it was a sort of remark that stuck in the craw of writers who identified as postmodernists, many of them advocates of post-structuralist theory. These were the folks who pigeonholed Rainey and a few other writers as Phrygians, even small fry. <laughs> Rainey established his little magazine, Alphabet, to advance his own aesthetic and, incidentally, to go after those who went after him. He 
He enjoyed a literary fight. For Rainey, the alphabet, A to Z, was both a source and a metaphor. In fact, it's everybody's source. From the alphabet, we make words and sentences and paragraphs and all the rest. In a way, the alphabet is everything. That is the metaphor. In Rainey's historical children's novel, the boy with an R in his hand, William Lyon Mackenzie finds his young apprentice, apprentice looking at some lead type in his printing office. He put one hand on Alec's shoulder and one on the setup type. There's freedom and liberty, lad. There's the mind of man. All his thoughts that thousands of people will read and find helpful. All these and thousands of wee bits of lead stuck together. Those wee bits of lead type were anything but abstract to Rainey. He learned typesetting to create the early numbers of alphabet letter by letter. If you're interested in his hands-on aspect of his career, there is some fascinating writing by Tim Ingster, one of Rainey's publishers, on the subject. I draw on his work in James Rainey on the grid. But right now, my concern is that grid. Why would I now want to get Rainey off it, at least to show the ways in which it doesn't limit him? It has to do with why I won't be selling my own soul to Norther Fry. I have read through a great deal of Fry with great admiration and finally a certain amount of resistance. But it was not until I read this that I understood the great difference between his mind and mine and also why there are aspects of Rainey's work that fail to speak to me. The wise man has a pattern or image of reality in his mind into which everything he knows fits, and into which everything he does not know could fit. And therefore, his approach to knowledge is something that the dung beetles of unorganized learning cannot even grasp. You should know that you're being addressed right now by one of those dung beetles of unorganized learning. You may wish to leave rather than get any deeper into the shit with me. OK, I'm overstating this. I am, of course, interested in organized knowledge. I have been patient with all the attempts to organize my knowledge in the decade of primary, secondary, and post-secondary education. But I have more and more begun to feel that it's possible to organize the life out of things to lean over much on the capacity of words to capture reality. So I like to approach any subject in the spirit of improvisation. My totem is the magpie, a bird that gathers shiny objects from here and there to feed its nest. The rainy who interests me most, then, is the rainy aware that the field of knowledge is a wild kingdom. Yes, he grids away, but those grids are not limiting when he is really cooking. In my previous lecture, I pointed out that he was only sometimes limited as an artist by the grids he so loved. Today, I want to stress the Rainey, who knew how important it is 
to be able to pry or bounce one's mind outside of inherit, inherited imprisoning systems, who knew how to improvise, who could make plays out of the simplest things he found in his own environment. This is also the Rainey who was capable of creating a comprehensive literary system of great flexibility in his masterpiece, The Donnelly Trilogy. Here from, uh, here, from the editorial to Alphabet 4, is his vision of an alternative theater. There should be a club that does nothing but seasons of plays by Canadians. It should do them in a bare, long room of a store, probably infested by odd fellows or orangemen on easily avoidable nights. <laughs> Nobody should have any truck with that grand bugaboo lighting. Five, two hundred Mazda waters always turned on will do for any play that lights its own way, as a play should. What is most of all needed is not money, but a simple, austere idea. The point might be illustrated by his play for children called Names and Nicknames. This play, he says, takes place in the southwestern hamlet of Broxton around 1900. The play was written with a bare stage in mind. All of stage setting can be accomplished with words, pantomime, the human body, music from rhythm band instruments, the audience themselves. Dress the stage with a stepladder. When Thorntree climbs up onto the roof, to listen down the chimney, this step letter is all that's needed. I don't know if rhythm bands are still formed to introduce preschool students to music. I had some rhythm band experience myself when I was five years old. I didn't find it interesting. <laughs> but I am interested in Rainey's do-it-yourself drama, including the possibility of using the instruments to create sound effects for sophisticated plays. So I looked up rhythm bands online and found out that it's still possible to purchase rhythm band kits from prices ranging from $64 to $349.99. The cheapest kit contains the following. One tambourine, one rattle drum, one leather handbell, one stick handbell, one pair of maraca, one shaker egg, one castanet, one double-barreled wood sounder with hammer, and one four-inch music steel triangle with striker. Won't want me. <laughs> the significant thing about all the potential sounds made by these, those instruments is that they become metaphors in the context of the words and actions they accompany. Just one example. What were 80, el 80 elastic bands contributing to the soundscape of Rainey's play, Wakusta? Their thrumming can be a most ominous sound, suggestive of bowstrings, mind snapping, terror. Our corner grocery gave me a whole bag of elastic bands for nothing, by the way, and hours can be spent just modulating the sound according to the various lengths and thicknesses. I doubt that Northrop Fry advocated spending hours 
with elastic bands. Rainey will not have learned about domestic sources for sound from him, though he may have learned a thing or two from, from London's Nihilus Spasm Band, which made strange noises on improvised instrument, instruments. Those 200 watt lights notwithstanding, anyway, this drama is off the grid in the sense that it doesn't depend on technology. That's one sense in which it lights its own way. How does it work? Here is how Jay McPherson describes Rainey's dramaturgical austerity in a production of Listen to the Wind that she took in. And here there's a quote within a quote. The music composed or put together by the excellent teenage musicians we see on stage, in homage to the Peking opera whose visit to Canada changed my life, Rainey has said, I always have music in my plays with the musicians in plain sight. And the sound effects contributed by the chorus provide half the life and atmosphere of the play. The chorus mime, recite, sing, thump, clap, and play instruments from a quarter to pop bottle. Waving antlers, they are forest. Surging and whooshing, they are the sea. Holding flowers and twittering sweetly, they are a dewy English garden. When needed, they mingle on stage as party guests or a pack of starving dogs. A letter sent to London in the inner play is passed from hand to hand through the chorus to its recipient standing far right. In such ways, they are not there just to comment, like most choruses, but actively push the action on. Half the life and atmosphere of the play, that is, is created out of next to nothing. McPherson goes on about the child play simplicity of the means by which the effects are created. What is astonishing in Rainey's production is a sense of play, of freedom, of creation before one's eyes. Far from being instant or impromptu theater, every action has been carefully planned. But the whole company has contributed to its planning, particularly in the highly inventive work of the chorus. The oral and visual complexity of the Donnelly Trilogy is so much greater that I can't take the time today to go into it, though I do so in the book. Now, I want to go at this grid business in another way, by stressing what Rainey has said about the need for flexibility in thinking, in society, in politics, often by way of criticizing the rigidity of various systems we live within. He wanted us to be aware of those systems, to resist the conformity they encourage. One sort of grid that Rainey has trouble with was that imposed on the natural world by the geological survey. It certainly caused trouble along the Roman line in the Dolph Township, Concession 6, Lot 18 in particular. This is the lot on which the Donnelly family settled when they came to Upper Canada from Ireland. Early in Sticks and Stones, the first play of the trilogy, we are with the man who is bringing the international survey to the locale and is vouchsafed a view of what his work will mean to the future of that particular plot. He sees why it will be a bone of contention. To begin with, the way this plot is laid out, he tells his son who is with him, there's a small creek enters it from the next farm, crosses it, and then flows into the next farm, farm that is to be. It'll be the subject of a lawsuit, 
quarrels about water rights, flooding, they'll love that little creek. Why not do something to prevent the conflict, the sun wonders? <clears throat> Make the farms a different shape. Ah, uh, I'm not allowed to do that, Davy, the surveyor replies. The laws of geometry are the laws of geometry. No, people must make do with what right angles in Euclid and we surveyors and measurers provide for them. The scene in which this exchange takes place is bucolic. I seem to remember bright lights, certainly bird song. There is harmony between the surveyor and sun, and why not? The two of them are having a pleasant day north of London, Ontario, in, unspo in unspoiled, that is, unsettled nature. They are in process of imposing a foreign geometrical grid on the landscape so that newcomers, settlers, may buy and then own the land. The grid thus serves another system, capitalism. The surveyor is mildly ironic about the conflict he anticipates. Not his problem. The irony deepens and goes very dark when the ground under the Donnelly's feet becomes the ground of tragedy. This single scene is like the whole play in that it has a continuing resonance outside itself. We are living today under the changes to the biosphere wrought by the application of so-called technological advances. Critique of technology is at the heart of Rainey's vision. These days, it looks prophetic. Rainey, Rainey valorized the gridless. He had a curious and fascinating theory. Here comes raining off the wall. That living in the vicinity of anomalies in the grid produces non-conforming individuals, especially artists. You don't get a very interesting landscape when everything is chopped up into 90-degree angles. You have to fight that. Our lane at home, this is the farm in East Hope Township near Stratford, where he grew up, our lane is not at right angles with anything. My theory about culture is that you have to have a crooked road, which is the road in front of our farm because there were three families that were very interested in art there. This theory has some backing from William Blake, one of Rainey's favorite poets. Improvement makes straight roads, he writes, but the crooked roads without improvement are roads of genius. You may have your doubts, as I do, as to the validity of the theory, at least as expressed in the interview quoted above. But it was not a one-off. Here it is again, somewhat more developed in a section of Little Lake District where I was born, Poems. Published in Southwest Home, Rainey's last book of poems. In all its straight, surveyed push from Wilmot, to Goderich, the old Huron Road curb only once, defeated by the little lakes with their hemlock swamps, bottomless, where they bent him south and then north, and caught there for in their crooked snare painters and poets, storytellers, eccentrics who were born and lived and died there. In light of the theory, it occurs to me to look at the centered poems like this as released from the left-hand margin 
a little less grid like Lines ragged at both ends, form mirroring content. Though, of course, the lines are arranged around the central armature. The theory does lie more naturally in the poem than in the statement. Still, we don't just swallow poems. We think about what they do and what they say. The word, therefore, in the poem offers a pleasant but doubtful cause-effect relationship between a crooked road and non-conforming individuals. How far would Rainey take his theory of environmental determinism? And how seriously should we take it? It did make a strange appearance during the graduate class in Ontario literature and culture that he taught. One of the books on the course was Harold Innes's The Bias of Communication. We went in the week after it was assigned, says Jean Mackay, one of his students, and said, this guy's prose, prose style is impenetrable. And he said, of course he's got an impenetrable style. He was raised on a stony ridge in Oxford County. I don't suppose that remark would have made the prose any more palatable, but I suspect it gave the questioners pause. It must have made them wonder how on earth that second sentence could logically follow the first. Let me digress for a moment to say, as I'm reminded right here of something Rainey wrote in 14 Barrels from Sea to Sea, his prose account of the national tour of the Donnellys. In the Vancouver section of the book, we have this. Had an argument in the car with someone about rock music. I said the thunderstorms had been the first amplified rock music. And he said, no, thunderstorms are not the first rock bands. Stop saying that. <laughs> That's all we have in this rapid-fire diaristic account. So there's no way of knowing whether it was meant humorously and was taken wrong, or did he really believe what he was saying? Another fascinating head scratcher. As one who loved listening to Rainey for the ways he could illuminate a subject by approaching it from an unconventional angle and thus showing it in a completely new light, often leaving me in a state of awe. I'm inclined to be skeptical, but not entirely dismissive. It's certainly true what Jean Mackay, one of Rainey's most devoted supporters, concludes about the impenetrable prose moment. He walked through the same world in a totally different way. For me, almost everything in Rainey points toward or returns to his masterpiece, The Donnellys. And this unorthodox anti grid theory of environmental determinism does too, obliquely and with subtlety. In the first poem, in a three-part series called Entire Horse, poems written about the Donnellys to assist in the renewal of the town hall at Exeter, highway number four. In the Donnelly document, his scholarly companion piece to the Donnellys, Rainey refers to the emotive power of one factor to all involved, land. This embattled farm and the Donnelly's relationship with land and property should be seen as one of the most important features in this traumatic story. Donnelly's do not even appear in the poem in question, but for anyone who knows the trilogy, the image of the cage that appears near the end of it is metaphorically the one that confines that tragic family. Around Borsa Cane, 
The era, the roads twist after cowherds with willow gags, after wise woman spells, after chariots and the widest go round found in a mare's skin. But in the dull Canada, in Mount Carmel's brooder stove, St. Peter's fields, the roads cross at right angles, a careful Euclidean net. Roods, roars, spun by surveyors at a spider star's news at Bicula, Uban, and Terre. Like serpents, twitch grass roots, dragons, the Irish roads twist. The old crooked roads twist in the cage of the new. The speaker of this poem, one of three, the other sections voiced by Tom Donnelly and Mrs. Donnelly, is identified in a note as William Port, Lucan postmaster. In James Rainey on the grid, I simply quoted this poem as a further example of the environmental theory. When it came up again in this, I started looking more closely at it. I'm tempted to say at this point that perhaps my 20-odd years of experience in Newfoundland have shaped my vision anew. Surveying and town planning were unknown when Europeans started settling there. There is no grid in downtown St. John's, nor in any Newfoundland outports. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. James, you were going to take over. <laughs> well, thank you. <laughs> the pleasure to deliver Sam's words. It fell a little sadly sometimes, right? <laughs> Before we get to questions, and I hope I, I have I have some questions of my own anyway. But uh, before we get to questions, I um, I should mention we have I have some more information about Stan to share here. But it, it wasn't mentioned, but Stan edited Southwest O Home, and uh, the fact that it appeared in the beautiful edition that it did was was very much a Stan collaborating with Dad and drawing things out. The Donnelly documents book. Which is a quite it's includes lots of verbatim documents and dad's editorial interpretations of same, but it was Gene Mackay's work as an editor in that really made sure that it actually got published. Uh, it was fairly late in my father's life, about I think about 2004 it finally appeared, but we could see he was not you know his his energy and focus was beginning to to fade away, but Gene was able to guide that and to completion, just as Stan was able to shape Southwest Home, and which was a brick book, I think it was published by Brick, I believe. That was, and uh, just b before we get, is it possible to run the photos again? That we the, uh, I'll, I'll tell you why we didn't. I think you could probably guess who was who, but there are probably a few stories behind each of the photos that you might uh, you might enjoy. And, and as we're just getting ready to that it. Uh, it mentions here that uh, this is the, the bio. I'll leave this up because I sense this is a words festival document. I shouldn't be carrying it away with me. But uh, Stan Draglin was Professor Emeritus, Department of English, Western University. He taught creative writing at the Banff Center and at Los, and maybe others could help me, Paranoles Chile, Los Paranoles Chile. He was founder of Brick Magazine and Brick Books, a poetry publishing house. Between 1994 and 1997, he was poetry editor for McClelland and Stewart. Pecker Tracks, uh, Stan's uh, novel, was shortlisted for the Books in Canada First Novel Award. 
uh, Floating Voice, Duncan Campbell Scott and the Literature of Treaty 9, 1994, won the Gabriel Waugh Prize for Canadian Literary Criticism. 12 Bars, 2002, was co-winner of the B.P. Nickel Chapbook Award. And I think B.P. Nickel is one of the, the great figures in um, Canadian literature. He was published very early on in Alphabet, along with all kinds of other, other people. Um, and I can imagine Dad typesetting BP's poems were, were not, they were not on the grid. <laughs> I think, um, and if you ever heard, heard, had the fortune, you'd know why. But trying to imagine my dad typesetting them with his well-trained but, but very amateur setup is, is quite moving. The other story I should say, one of the family myths is that dad claimed he was setting type while going to teaching night school at the uh, University of Manitoba in the early editions of Alphabet. He said, yeah, it's no problem. You just get balanced a certain way in the type of, I think that's a myth, but it's a beautiful, a beautiful myth. Um, just going back to the stand here, the BP Nickel Chapbook Award, Apocrypha, Further Journeys 2003, won the Newfoundland and Labrador uh, Rogers Cable Award for nonfiction. Stormy Weather, uh, Foursomes was shortlisted for the E.J. Pratt Poetry Award, Strangers and Others, Newfoundland Essays, 2015, was shortlisted for the BMO Winterset Award. Uh, Stan Dragon has also published Journeys Through Bookland and Other Passages, uh, and The Bees and the Invisible Essays in Contemporary English Canadian Writing. 2008 saw the publication of Drowned Lands, a novel. Deep 2, T-O-O, a prose oddity, prose oddity appeared in 2013. The Bricoleur and His Sentences was published in 2014. Strangers and Others, The Great Eastern in 2016, and Gerald Squires in 2017. Stan died suddenly of cardiac arrest on August the 2nd while hiking in Newfoundland with Beth Follett. The lecture is based on his book, James Rainey on the Grid, which will be published by Porcupine's Quill. So that, and that's, we, we know it's coming from Porcupine's Quill. We're just not sure when, but um, please uh, don't hesitate to look at the Porcupine's Quill website or contact us and we'll uh, try to make, as soon as that's, we're sure, we'll let, let that be known as well. Um, oh, now the, the photos are with us. Now, I think many of them are from the free press, I think, and probably should, they should probably have owned by Post Media or something on them, but we have the last honest controller in free press history with us, so maybe he'll, he'll grant us. Um, but my dad's last big accomplishment um, was uh, watercolors, and curated by Tom Smart, who was director at the um, McMichael at the time. These were the lead part of Stan's talk, but we thought those words worked better just for you to puzzle over. This, I think, is the, that's the cover of the fourth thing. Look, this was taken by my good friend and frequent video collaborator at the Free Press, Morris Lamont, in 1989. This is at the Nihilist Picnic in the men's kick the shoe competition. And somewhere right in the line with Dad is Keith Turnbull, who was very involved as director um, and collaborator with all the Donnelly, the Donnelly work. That, I think, is taken by Arnhem Walter, or Walters, but anyway, by 1967, he had come over from Germany. I think he was the wrestling champion of the German, of the Wehrmacht, mm -hmm. or something like that, maybe the tank corps in World War II, lived down off Huron Street to a wonderful commercial and art photographer, and that, of course, is Stan. Um, and you can see if you linger on those, that gives a little bit of the flavor of going on and off the grid, I think, with words. Thanks very much for bringing those back. Um, are, are there any questions? And I, Terry may well be the one who can answer better than I, or um, and may, I don't know if my sister is connected with us through through Zoom, but yeah. Oh, I have a call oh, over here, Heidi. Was um, was he uh, was was my father against deconstruction or for it? Um, Terry, would that have entered into your thesis at all, or is that uh, yeah. I could I could I could give a very glib answer. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're. Uh, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but oh, if you want, yeah, maybe there's a, there's a microphone here if anyone would when they're asking it. I uh, I think probably opposed. Um, he 
I mean, if this is an oblique answer, but there's the beautiful passage about how you, you don't need a light, tech, a light technician in theater. You know, he was, he was a zealot in some ways, and he was, you know, was, he was committed to his approach, and he could be very tolerant and, in fact, welcome disruptive and um, creative free spirits, but I don't, I would say probably not, for what it's worth. Um, the, I always felt when I hear that and read that business about not needing any lights other than the basic light, it just meant to Dad there was one less person to argue with when he was putting on his plays. You know, no light designer was going to show up and say, well, that's not going to work because, you know, just turn the damn lights on, leave them on. But, but later in his career, I, I mean, some of his greatest works had spectacular lighting effects. I mean, when the ones that were presented at Stratford, you know, had all the technology of the Stratford Festival, and I don't remember Dad getting up on the stage saying, just turn them on, leave them on, <laughs> let Alice wander around in his bright and bright light, one bulb will... No, so I think, but I think that also shows, though, I'm using it as an example of his single-mindedness, that if that was, you know, if, if he did have lighting and things like that, he did welcome deconstruction. And, you know, many, many of his friends and allies were very involved in the movement, but not for his own purposes, no. Yeah. Okay, well, I, I'm, uh, I, I wrote my thesis even a little before I think T Terry did a, a book about Brantford, so my grasp of what's happening in literary criticism is, uh, and I was never a much of a theory person I, uh, myself, so I would say that sounds right, solidarity, deconstructionist or non-deconstructionist. And it also, I mean, I, I should acknowledge Heidi is, I mean, we talked about, I mean, poetry events in London. Well, Heidi, is, you've organized. How many poetry events do you think you've hosted? But all but hosted. You provide. Well, that's. I mean, that's hosting them really. Anyone can sign the people up, but to give them a you know a good space and a good microphone, that's the and good food. That's the. This is at the Mykonos. Yeah, bravo. Um, are there? Leaf. These are, the, these are the Massey lectures, I think we're talking. This is yeah. the Massey lecture, and the text of the Massey lectures, I know your wife Susan has read as well. She yeah. acknowledges the, um, the importance of Massey lectures, and she says that they are the most important lectures that she's ever given. Yeah. And she says that they're the most important lectures that she's ever given. And she says that they are the most important lectures that she's ever given. And she says that they are the most important lectures that she's ever given. And she says that they are the most important lectures that she's ever given. And she says that they are Thompson's Highway's presence. He came to Western as a very gifted piano, classical piano player with his, uh, as a student of William Aid, but he, Thompson Highway, Graham Greene, and Gary Farmer all allied themselves with NDWT workshops for some of the things like Wacousta. And when you think of their careers subsequently, Thompson, Gary, and Graham Greene, that's pretty extraordinary. They're all very much at the beginning of their careers, and yet we're up at campus um, doing dramatic workshops with the NDWT and others. Oh, Susan. Well, actually, Tom Smart, who's yeah. a good one, but yeah. also the Wacousta Institute, which is where Tom Smart came from. Yeah, Tom Smart. I, I laugh when I think what Lee said, yeah, that um, Thompson wrote his main influences, the three main influences, he said. Oh, oh, dearest, I think they want the mic. Oh, all right. Is this any better? Yes, it's better. 
That's okay. all I do. I'm Sorry. Gonna I'm going to shut my eyes and just listen. <laughs> anyway, Thompson listed his three main influences. And he started with Shakespeare, and then he went into Yeats. And then he said, and James Rainey. And I thought, wow, that's pretty good. You know, yeah. right up there is Shakespeare and Yeats. So, yeah, it was a, a very good book. Well, I don't know if it would ever be the subject of a future lecture here, but to me, it's one of the great stories in Canadian theater is that you have, I mean, Graham Greene's going to go on and get nominated for a, an Oscar. Um, Thompson High was going to write some of the greatest plays anywhere. And Gary Farmer is, a, you know, is in movies, in music, Constantly, he's a different, you know, there are three very different creative spirits, but they were all up there early on. And because the NDWT was willing to reach out and, uh, and welcome some people, and also, they were also, I think, I'll, I'll acknowledge this, this is one of the frustrating things about my, to me, working my father, is he would devote huge energy to these novels by Major John Richardson, who is, they're ripping yarns, but let me tell you, they're, they're not, they're not something that's going to be staged in that, that little theater dad's time. They need, they're on an enormous scale, and they, I don't know if they ever outstripped the resources of the NDWT, but they were not, they were not likely to be big, big theater hits, but they're fascinating projects, that's for sure. Well, I have a question. Now, and I should mention, Words Festival continues spectacular stuff here. But if you wanted to see a play by James Rainey this afternoon at four o'clock, does anyone know where that might happen? And one of the actors, pardon? The Epiphany Church. The Epiphany Church. And Gyroscope, one of my, my, I like probably my father's last big coherent theater piece is being revived by Alvago Ruth. So um, I would, words, stay here for words. You can't go wrong with words, but if I, if I abandon you, and Susan abandons you and some others, we're, we're headed over there to, uh, and I think, it, I think this is the closing performance. One of the actors, Dan Ebbs, was, uh, was here, and I think Dan's had a, was sitting at the back. I think, I don't know if he's, I think it's Dan, Dan coming back. But, but anyway, Dan, I think, has had a tremendous time because it uses some of the sound poetry um, that we was talked about. It's, it, it's with the play and some of the, it plays around with that. And it's about, it's about two poets who may or may not be somewhat based on mom and dad, but, but maybe not, but maybe. I think, hi. Anything else, are there any? Terry, I wondered, did you, we, we, you came to this and then delivered it so beautifully. Were you surprised at all as you read through it and found? I was new. Yeah. Personal. Well, I don't have much. Yeah. <laughs> really? Yeah. Oh, I see. Yeah. No, I, I, I did. Uh, I, en I enjoyed the piece very, very much. And I, you know, I love Stan. He yeah. brought Stan closer to me. And as I say, it was, it was very special to be able yeah. to be, to be the one to speak for him today. And I should mention, I, I know there are plans through the Word Festival to, to honor Stan's memory later on. It was partly, there was, there was to be something this weekend. Originally, we, it was thought, but there was a beautiful event in St. John's yesterday um, that I, I think is still out there. Um, if you can find, and if you need the link, we, I think we can find you the link. The, there's then on December the 6th, I think is it in Toronto, there's an, an event as well to honor Stan's memory, and there will be something through words, and I think probably we're just, but their date hasn't been established, obviously, and uh, nor the circumstances, but I, I think some of the people who are, took part in the St. John's event have indicated they'd be very happy to come to London and, and share in that, that event, too. So it was, a, it was a beautiful way to remember. Also, I think, well, maybe, are we, I think there were, we seem to have reached I put in the plug for gyroscope I wanted to put in. I'd, I'd like to thank the, uh, the technical people who did a marvelous job and this beautiful space. And I think, I think just leaving, but I think if you look out the window, I think there's a beautiful Ron Benner work of art just out and there are people by it. Um, and thank the Words Festival again. This is, uh, let's have some applause for, for Stan Draglin and Terry Griggs. Thank you.
Catherine. 